Hello everyone, it's Christy and Ezio and we're blogging for the Qualitative Election Study of Britain 2015 and we are done with our pre-election focus group data collection. <laughs> 13 focus groups in three weeks. <laughs> High five. <laughs> so do you want to start with how great, oh my gosh, so first Mark Shepard at Glasgow, um, the Strathclyde. We love you. So amazing. Thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. Also, yeah, so I'll, everyone who helped us organize, uh, Rob Johns, Stephen Bates, Roger Scully, we've got a little thank you present for you, Roger, when we come back to see you. Uh, all of those um, advisory board members were incredibly vital to making sure we actually got our data collection done and uh, on budget. Yeah. So, and in case, uh, on a completely different note, um, I have two cats and they will be roaming around, making their presence felt. So you've just seen Calypso go by and Artemis is somewhere around. So, yeah. They're yeah. going to be part of the vlog tonight. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, Glasgow and Strathclyde, how it went? Brilliant. Really brilliant. Uh, we had about 11 participants and um, the depth of data that we got from people who were SNP supporters and people who were not SNP supporters but voting SNP was really amazing, really amazing. Agreed. I mean, I think, um, you know, when we left Essex, I felt like I understood, especially UKIP voters, a lot better. Mm. And I, it felt like, yes, this was the data that we needed to collect. And when we left Glasgow, I also felt like, right, we've got really good insights now, not from our gut feeling or stuff we read in the papers, but actually out of the mouths of, of voters. Yeah. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about what, why it was so good and, and what was so good, good about it. I mean, for me, what was really interesting about the Glasgow focus groups is that we got, I got an insight into people who were voting SNP, but who didn't necessarily consider themselves SNP partisans. So, you know, they didn't consider themselves close to the SNP in that sense, as you would consider yourself close to a party. Um, and so we had people saying um, that if in the parliament election, they would naturally feel themselves as green voters. But in this election, they felt that they wanted to vote SNP and they gave us quite a few reasons for uh, doing so. One of the things was, uh, you know, up let's mm. let's show the rest of the uk or let's show the main parties what we can do mm -hmm. you know um so that was one of the reasons and other reasons is they wanted to be part of this wave it was this positive they felt it was a positive campaign mm -hmm. and it was it stood for something and the snp would do something for scotland and they wanted to be part of that yeah i think it's important to notice that i can't think there might be one person in all of the focus groups you know the ones we did so it was a total of like eight plus nine plus four in mm -hmm. total that um, the only one of those um, persons might be, uh, yes, I want to see another independence referendum very quickly. The rest were not voting for the SNP because of the referendum. They were voting for it because they felt that it was the best, the party that best represented their local interests in Scotland, their constituency interests as a Scottish constituency, and would go to Westminster to be a voice for Scottish voices, for, for Scottish voters in, in Parliament, and they weren't seeing that kind of sensitivity or representation from the other main parties. Yeah. Um, mind you, all these voters did vote yes in the referendum, but they, the vote that they were giving the SNP in this election was not a vote for another referendum, mm -hmm. but um, as Christy said, it was for different issues. Yeah, and representation and identity came across. So you uh, wanted to pick up, um, so very quickly, we're going to be doing vlogs all day long so that there are videos about the QESB all night for the election coverage from the time well before the polls close. We'll talk about um, how people were thinking about things right the way through to probably 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock in the morning. We want to put out videos on our focus group results, giving some preliminary impressions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came up in the focus groups was about the two campaigns. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk a bit about this now? Yeah, uh, and we will talk about it in the in the other vlogs as well, but I'll, we'll foreshadow that now. Mm -hmm. um, we had at least two participants who pointed out, and these were participants in different groups, one participant in Dundee and another one in Glasgow, who pointed out that their primary impression of the campaign was that there were two campaigns going on. And I think for both of us, that was quite a quite an insightful comment. Um, they felt that there was a campaign going on in Scotland, 
and then there was a campaign going on in the rest of the UK. Um, and they felt that these two campuses were not necessarily speaking to each other. They were they were talking about completely different things, and that the tone of these campaigns was very different. So the one in Scotland was very very positive, very much about looking forward, looking ahead. What can we do? How can we do it? How can we all come together and so on? And then in the rest of the UK, there was a lot of fear mongering. Don't vote in this way because this is what you're going to get. Rather than vote for us mm -hmm. because this is what we can do for you. Yeah. Definitely. And another thing that I thought was, um, uh, again, in, in interesting and coming from the mouths of the participants was this notion that the, there's a, been a continuity in, in Scotland from refer, the referendum vote into this election. And we heard about it in Dundee in terms of the values. And in Glasgow, we had some students who came in and one of the students talked about the fact that his friends were very aware of the independence referendum, um, had an opinion about it, and felt politically engaged on the referendum, but that was a very simple thing. And this being a bit more of a complicated political choice, people were still engaged enough from the referendum to carry that over and to stay involved for the 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 election campaign so we'll see if that feeling bears out in the numbers which would if we if that was the case what we should see is a step shift in increase in the vote turnout of younger voters people under let's say the age of 25 in scotland as compared with england and wales and northern ireland mm. and if that's the case then we're that these ideas are certainly being picked up on hold on i got a cat alert <laughs> no don't drink my drink sorry <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Do you want to mention quickly about the participant who mentioned identity and being Scottish? I don't know if you remember this. No. Ah, okay, okay, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> there was one of our participants who gave a very eloquent explanation of what he saw as the evolution of Scottish identity in the last five years. And this guy was perhaps in his late 30s at the most, or early 40s, and he said that over the course of his lifetime, what it meant to be Scottish has changed quite a lot. And we, you know, before when he was growing up, it was mostly defined as um, sort of accepting whatever Westminster doled out to Scottish voters and to Scotland in terms of policies. But now he felt that what it means to be Scottish has taken on a real intensity, and not an anti-English thing. It just it's more of a positive of what the values of Scotland are and what it means to be Scottish. It's clearer to him now than it was before, and he said he was a yes voter on the referendum, but he had no interest in seeing another referendum because he said he agreed with Nicola that there would have to be a material change on the ground in Scotland before another referendum would be warranted. Just holding another referendum isn't going to change anybody's mind. Something else would have to change first in order to justify a referendum. But for him, he definitely felt that his sense of Scottishness had been transformed as a consequence of these discussions. And he also felt like that was a very positive thing for him. Mm -hmm. So really good stuff out of yeah, out of really really in depth and um, kind of um, of the same quality from as the other focus groups and it really I mean I am so excited to look at this data in the future I mean it, we have so much for the next five years at yeah. least so yeah. <laughs> yeah we're gonna be busy for the next five years and I'm already getting requests when are your transcripts gonna be out um, and as soon as we possibly can is the answer <laughs> but we of course still have our post election so not only do we have this um, episode of the vlog and all the vlog episodes we'll be doing tonight, but then we're going back into the field to talk to people after the election to get their reactions to how the vote ended up turning out and how they think the coalition or the government formation, I should say, is proceeding and their reactions. Oh, uh, one other thing, yeah, we should mention is the question that I came up with on the fly in the middle of the mm. focus group. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I talked about identity, do you want to talk about that one? Yeah, so I think uh, Christy's question was, um, there is this SNP wave, at least according to the polling that's happening in Scotland. Um, how do you, so we ask participants, what are your reactions to this wave? How do you feel? You know, some people may feel excited, some people may feel terrified, some people may feel um, exhilarated or whatever. What are your reactions? And it was quite interesting because it shows a partisan identity in, in a way. I mean, some people who identified as the SNP were, um, uh, you know, undoubtedly excited. 
Um, and then there we had one participant who identified himself as conservative who was terrified. Um, and then everybody else was excited but also a bit nervous mm -hmm. because they were not really sure what was going to happen after. You know, if the SNP did win, win the number of seats that they have been projected to win, what is that going to mean? for um, government formation and, and in the long term. Yeah. So there was a, a, a mixture of the two. Yeah, and that's what I think was most interesting was that it's, I think, the media tends to caricaturize the SNP voters or why people are voting for the SNP as being yeah. this sort of blindly loyal, independence-driven, um, you know, savages north of the border, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in all honesty, people here feel, a, I think, a deep responsibility about this vote, that they are saying something with this vote, but it's mm -hmm. not that they want an independent, you know, not everybody is saying, you know, actually a very small minority want another independence vote. Um, and they also see this as a, a very, um, yeah, unknown quantity, what's going to happen. But they also feel like they're part of this pushback, this transformation of how politics has been done. And politics, they felt that under the Conservatives, they weren't getting policies that represented Scotland, so they allied themselves with Labour. And then Labour, under New Labour and Tony Blair, increasingly became indistinguishable from the Conservatives. So mm. why would you put your voice there for Scotland when it wasn't even representing your, your policies yeah. or your values? And so now, with this big shift over to the SNP, they're very aware that this is a big deal. Um, but they also know that their voices are a big deal, that mm -hmm. having this big block of SNP voters is about giving people in Scotland a voice that they don't feel they've had under Labour and mm. that they did not have under the Conservatives. Mm. So I think, you know, Ed Miliband, when he came up here, he was quoted in the paper, and this is only a portion of his discussion, but he said things along the line of, you know, your parents went out leafleting for Labour and your grandparents went out leafleting for Labour and think about the values they were standing up for. I would imagine that our participants who are voting SNP would say, well, but when have you stood up for our values? Where are you standing up for our yeah. values and representing our Scottish constituencies and our Scottish councils? Yeah. Where is that in your platform, your manifesto? Yeah. I think they would say that our values haven't changed. Your values have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this idea that we are still there, you just move to the right. <laughs> is driving a lot yeah. of this switching to the SNP. Yeah. So. And we had one participant in the Glasgow focus groups who said, um, that in Scotland, the SNP, to him at least, is the only party on the left mm -hmm. that is viable. And in fact, he said that, you know, we do need to start building up another party that can be an alternative to the SNP. Even more left. Even more <laughs> left. Yeah. And, uh, which is interesting because I, I would have thought that actually the Greens would have been that alternative. But for some reason, they are not, people are not necessarily flocking to the Greens as an alternative left party. Right. I mean, we the way they do in England. And exactly. Yeah. 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 So we're going to wrap up because we have a lot of other things to talk about and record today. So until next time, I've been Christy. And it's you. And we'll see you next time on the Qualitative Election Study of Britain when we do our post-election um, night, post-election uh, vlogs from the field. <laughs> Bye. Bye.